they are ours. I used to go to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings with my daughter. Once I even said I was an alcoholic just to please her. I thought an alcoholic was just someone who drank more than I did. I don't know when the drink stopped working. I didn't drink to oblivion. I didn't even drink to get drunk. I just wanted enough to take away the fear, boost my self-confidence, make me feel like I was okay, that I fit in. When it got bad enough, I stopped. That was grim. But eventually, I felt better physically. Then stark reality set in, and I was left with this cold, lonely, remorseless anxiety and no crutch. It wasn't just the alcohol. I hadn't done anything, really, to change my life. All I'd done was stop drinking. Alcohol had altered my perception of reality, and when reality set in, I couldn't handle it. So after months of misery, I started drinking again. My husband and I entertained a great deal. I soon realized that one or two dry martinis and a good bottle of wine, or bad for that matter, was better than three months of psychotherapy any time. Drinking gave me the confidence that I needed, and it took away my fear. I had the perfect life, really. Three lovely children, a loving and successful husband, a beautiful home, nice cars, plenty of money, and wonderful friends. But I still felt like an outsider. I desperately lacked confidence without a drink in my hand. Shortly after my last child left home, I fell and broke my neck. After months in the hospital, I was sent home with instructions to take as much Valium as I needed. And I did. I was still drinking, though not as much now that I had the Valium. But I couldn't always remember just how many pills I'd taken. I was confused. Couldn't remember things. And apparently, I was acting rather strangely. I knew I should stop and that I should taper off gradually, but I didn't, of course. I was crying all the time. I had blinding headaches, weird flashbacks. I could barely function. Eventually, though, the symptoms lessened, and I was so proud. I had done it all myself. Of course, I was still drinking all the time, but for God's sake, so was everyone else that I knew. And then, then my mother died, and shortly after, my husband got Alzheimer's. Naturally, I drank to deal with it all. I was in a grown-up body, having grown-up experiences, but with childish emotions. My emotional growth had been stunted by alcohol, and I didn't know how to deal with life at all. I was utterly self-centered, bewildered, fearful, resentful, and acutely sensitive to criticism. My ability to lie outwardly, kid myself inwardly, grew with every drink I took. Drinking was my solution. It was my comfort, my refuge, and most of all, it was the shameful secret that I kept even from myself. I compared my insides to other people's outsides. In other words, I compared the way I felt on the inside to the way other people looked on the outside. And my ability to lie about my own feelings, my sense of shame and self-loathing, kept growing. Then sometime after my husband died, I met up with an old friend who drank quite a lot too, and we started traveling together. You know, alcoholism is a disease of denial, and despite my very frequent injuries and illnesses, it never occurred to me that alcohol might be the problem. I fell and broke my shoulder and knees. I had injections for nausea in the Seychelles in South Africa. I had ultrasound for what ailed me, and then in Zimbabwe, I fell again and had to have stitches in my tongue. Then, 
in 1994, I had a stroke. My daughter came home to take care of me, and she dragged me into AA by the hair. I didn't know what was going on, really. But when she left, I promised I would continue to go to meetings, and I did. I was given a sponsor. I started working the steps, and, and finally one day I said, I'm Harriet, and I'm an alcoholic. Well, fantastic, I thought. There's the first step. I'll have the other 11 done by Friday. But really, I knew it was the only way I was going to save my own life. Now, all these different people come to take me to meetings. There's Jim with a ponytail and Robert with a Rolls Royce. There's another very handsome young chap. And then there's Walter, who is tattooed from head to toe. God only knows what the neighbors think. And then there's the God thing. Now, I had tried that, but God had never done any of the things that I'd asked. So, eventually, I just had to accept the fact that either God is or he isn't. I don't understand God, but he understands me. My own spiritual growth came about gradually as a result of working the steps. And now I'm convinced that I'm not alone. I talk to God daily. I hand things over to him, and I ask him to direct my thinking. I do the work, and he does the worrying. He never does any of the work, but he doesn't want me to worry. I do wish he'd get a clock, though, because he has absolutely no sense of time or urgency, which I find highly irritating. But since I've been sober, my daughter's gotten a divorce, my son's gotten cancer, I've had a hip, a shoulder, and a knee replaced. Bells go off now when I go through airport security. I've lost most of my central vision in the last year, and I can no longer drive or read. When I see young people getting into recovery now, I wish I'd done it long ago. I would have been a better person much sooner, and I wouldn't have felt so alone. I was brought up to just deal with things, you know, get on with it, don't complain. And I drank to give myself confidence and to take away my fear. I always wanted to be the perfect hostess, the ideal wife and mother, the wittiest, the smartest, the best dressed. Alcohol gave me the illusion that I was those things. But now I have the tools to deal with life on life's terms. And let me tell you, getting old is not for the faint of heart. Getting into recovery is like standing on a bridge over a river with your pants on fire and not knowing what to do. Just jump in. There are very few families who haven't been affected by the disease of addiction. It cuts across race, age, class, gender, and all income earning levels. It's often a family shameful secret that nobody wants to talk about. And our drug laws and our drug policies aren't helping. In fact, they're making it worse. Drug charges are typically felony charges, as opposed to drunk driving, which only carries a misdemeanor, a crime more commonly committed by the white middle class. Quite frankly, I feel a lot more threatened by a drunk